Matthew chapter 4 verses 18 to 22 as Jesus was walking beside the Sea of Galilee he saw two brothers Simon called Peter and his brother Andrew they were casting a net into the lake for they were fishermen come follow me Jesus said and I will make you fishers of men at once they left their nets and followed him going on from there he saw two other brothers James son of Zebedee and his brother John they were in a boat with their father Zebedee preparing their nets Jesus called them and immediately they left the boat and their father and followed him shall we pray father we come to you in Jesus name we pray as we come to meditate your word that you will speak with us. Let your Holy Spirit enlighten our hearts, inform our minds and influence change in our lives. Lord, we pray that you give us receptive hearts, receptive ears. We pray that the devil will have no say in anything of Lord, what we have to do in our lives. We pray that our flesh will not dictate what we have to do and how we need to live. But let your word, Lord, fill our hearts, minds, in our lives that we will just live and walk according to your word give us lord the grace to expound and share your word let your name be glorified in jesus name we pray amen we read here jesus was walking by the sea of galilee and he sees two brothers simon peter and his brother andrew and they were casting a net into the lake and uh, as regular business that day they were doing their work and right suddenly in the middle of their work when they never expected they least expected something different to happen Jesus walks by and he looks at them and he says come follow me and they immediately left at once they left their nets and boats and they began to follow Jesus and then he goes a little further and he finds Two other brothers, James the son of Zebedee and his brother John. James and John, sons of Zebedee. And he finds them and he calls them also. They were with their father. It was their family business. They were busy with their work. Taking care of their boats and nets and getting ready uh, to go fishing. They were preparing their nets. And Jesus called them out and said, come follow me. And immediately verse 20, 22 says, they left the boat and their father and they followed Jesus what we're talking about here and what we've just read is about following Jesus if we should title this morning's message it is growing as a disciple of the Lord Jesus how you and I should grow as a disciple firstly we have been called Jesus called them and we've also received the call of God Jesus has revealed himself to us we have come to know the Lord Jesus as our personal lives. Thank God for that. We've been saved. We are washed by the blood of Jesus. We've been assured of the free gift of eternal life through the forgiveness of sins. Praise God for that. But it, it doesn't end there. It doesn't end with the calling. It is the beginning. The calling is only the beginning. We've begun our walk with Jesus. We've begun a relationship with the Lord Jesus. But now... As a disciple of the Lord Jesus, he wants us to grow. And right at the beginning in response to the call, you see there was a transformation that happened there in their lives. There was a shift, there was a change that happened in their lives. They did not continue doing their work and continue to follow Jesus. When Jesus called them, they left whatever they were doing right away as it was and they immediately began to follow Jesus. If you and I need to grow as a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ, we need to be people who will follow Jesus and not follow Jesus and something else. We cannot serve two masters. Jesus said, follow me. And at once, immediately, they left their boats, their nets, and even their father and followed Jesus of course they physically left everything at at once they physically began to walk away from everything they were doing now this morning that may not literally apply to us God is not asking us to 
uh, stop working, stop studying, um, stop living with our families and follow Jesus. Some people uh, try to take this passage of scripture to an extreme and uh, say you have to literally hate your father, mother, brother, sister if you have to follow Jesus. God is not asking us to literally hate people. God is a God of love. He loves everybody and he wants us to love everyone. But what does it say if we have to grow in being a disciple of the Lord Jesus, we cannot follow something of the past and continue also and begin to follow Jesus. We cannot have the best of both the worlds. That's how sometimes many people are trying to do. They want to have the world. They want to have the pleasures of sin. They want to have everything that they had in their past life and also still want to follow Jesus. They want the blessing from Jesus. Sometimes people want to please other people, ungodly people, unsaved people, and at the same time want to follow Jesus. We have to have a single uh, person to whom, to whom we can pledge our allegiance to. The one person to whom we pledge our allegiance, complete 100% allegiance, is to Jesus and to Jesus alone. Everything else of the world takes second place in our lives. Every other person in this world also takes second place in our lives. It's Jesus who is first for us. Our love, our attention, our priority is first to the Lord Jesus Christ. Our lives should be centered around Jesus to do his will, to please him all the time in everything we do and say. That, it, that is what it means to truly, literally follow Jesus if anything we do in this world, if anything we do in our lives, the first question we should be asking ourselves is this, would Jesus do this? Would this be pleasing to the Lord Jesus Christ? Would he be pleased with me in what I do and what I say? If we will ask that question, we will surely be following Jesus fully 100%. Amen. If we, have, if we have to follow Jesus fully, if we have to grow as a disciple, we have to let go of everything that comes in between us and Jesus. It could be different for different people. For them, it was the boats, the nets, and what they depended on for their living, their father, they just had to let go of it. They had to let go of the profession. They had to let go of the family tradition of following the profession that their fathers did. They had to let go of it. I don't know what we have to let go if we have to grow as a disciple of the Lord Jesus. If you remember the story, um, the incident where Jesus uh, talks about the rich young man who came to him and asked him, what must I do to eter receive eternal life? Jesus looked at him and said, go sell all your possessions. Go sell it, give it to the poor and then come follow me. The Bible says that he went away sad because he had great wealth. Why did he go away sad? Because he was not willing to let go of what he needed to let go. Unless we let go of what we need to let go, we cannot get what we need to get. I repeat that again. Unless we let go of what we need to let go, we will not find, we will not get what we need to get. If you need a great spiritual life, if you need a great intimate walk with the Lord Jesus Christ, if you need to grow as a disciple of the Lord Jesus, what you and I need to be doing is we need to let go anything that comes in between us and Jesus. It may be sin. It may be pleasing people around us. It may be setting priorities right. Whatever it is. It may be even church attendance. Maybe we have been uh, once in a while going to church. And we've not been consistent in following Jesus. It may be our time alone with God in prayer, in study of his word. Whatever it is, if we have not been consistent, we need to change. We need to let go of anything that comes in between us and God. Anything that takes the place of God in our lives. If we let go of that, we will be true to Jesus. We will be truly a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ. They let go of it immediately. They didn't give excuses. They didn't say, give me some more time. Let me just think about it. Let me go consult with my parents. Let me go consult with my you know, relatives. Let me see what others say about it. In obeying the word of God, in following the principles of the word of God, 
in following the doctrines of God's word. We don't have to consult with anybody. We don't have to consult with flesh and blood. If we need to be baptized, we don't have to consult with somebody else and ask if it is the right thing to do, if it's all right for me to be baptized. If the word of God says so, we just got to obey it. That is how we follow Jesus. You may have times where you may have situations where people may put you under pressure, where you will have to please them. But that's where we have to stand up and say, I belong to Jesus. I belong to the light. It may be friends, it may be relatives. They may be coming to rob your time, your, your attention. They may, they may come and rob you know, your focus in life, in following Jesus. They may say, let's go here, let's do that. And so many other things. If, there's, if there are other things that are coming into your life, it takes the place of Jesus, your love for Jesus. If there are other things that you love more than loving Jesus, you need to let go of that and say, I'm going to choose to follow Jesus. Hallelujah. That rich young man went away sad because his heart, his love, his affections were upon the wealth that he had. He was not willing to let go of it. He was not willing to part with it. He said, how can I leave this? This is very dear to me. Jesus put him on the spot. Jesus told him, you know, first Jesus said, follow the commandments. Do not murder. Do not lie. Worship the Lord your God. Honor your parents. He said, oh, all these commands, I have been keeping them right from my childhood. I've been faithful in keeping all these commands. Which, then why shouldn't I not eter receive eternal life? Then Jesus says, go. Let go of what you need to let go. Is there something that you need to let go? Is there something that, that is there as a hindrance in your life, in your heart, that you think that would be a hindrance in growing as a disciple of the Lord Jesus? Is there something that you've been continuing on even after salvation? Is there something that has been sticking on to your life? May the Holy Spirit help you to identify that. May the Spirit of God help you to identify what, what are the things that I need to let go to grow as a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ. We cannot be a disciple of Jesus. We cannot serve God and serve the world also. We cannot serve two masters. If we serve God, we have to say no to the world. If we serve God, if we love Jesus, if we follow Jesus, we have to say no to the wrong things of the world. People will say, oh, everybody does it that way. Why don't you also do it? There's nothing wrong. Take, for example, a simple thing like, uh, you know, uh, getting anything done from any government office. Everybody gives bribes to get it done quickly. Well, we may not, you know, do wrong things, manipulate uh, and change the rules or do things against the rules of the government and give bribes. But to get so something done quickly... That's a good temptation that can, you know, come around when we have to get something done. To get something done quickly, we might feel like, oh, they expect it. Why don't we just give it to them? If we give some money, they'll get it done fast. It won't take as long as it usually takes. But that's where is a test for our Christian walk. That's where we have to be careful to say, I'm, not, I'm following Jesus. I'm a disciple of the Lord Jesus. As a disciple of the Lord Jesus, I will not do it the shortcut. I'll do it as a way it has to be done. Hallelujah. Amen. It may be simple, small things, small obligations that we want, small things where we could try something and, and, and manipulate people and use our influence, use our power, use people around us and get things done. But that, is that how would Jesus would do things? What would Jesus do if he was walking in my shoes? What would Jesus do? If he was in my place, what would he do? Would he do that? Would he watch this on television? Would he watch that movie? What would Jesus do? Would he watch that on, in, on the internet? Would he do that? That's how we need to check our lives. If we have, are we following Jesus? They left all they needed to leave right away. Unless we leave what we need to leave, we will not get what we need to get. We want to receive eternal life. We want to be a disciple of Jesus. Amen.
and if we are choosing to be a disciple of Jesus, if we are choosing to follow Jesus, we have to let go of everything. Let go of everything. What would, what would be according to God's word? What would please God? That should be our first priority. Give God the first place in your life and see how God takes you, you know, and blesses you. God watches over every sacrifice that you make. God watches over every decision that you make to please him. God watches. God is looking at everything. He keeps an account of everything we do. And so for nothing that you do, you will go without receiving a reward. You will always be rightly rewarded for everything that you do according to righteousness and justice. Hallelujah. Praise God. Praise God. God give, give God the first place. Turn with me to, in the same book of Matthew, uh, Gospel of Matthew, turn to chapter 8, chapter 8, and read verses 18 to 22. Oh, sorry. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Matthew 8, 18 to 22. When Jesus saw the crowd around him, he gave orders to cross to the other side of the lake. Then a teacher of the law came to him and said, Teacher, I will follow you wherever you go. Oh, well, this man was very excited. He saw how Jesus is speaking great things because right now Jesus has been speaking uh, the Sermon on the Mount, which is commonly called the Sermon on the Mount from chapter 5 to 7. We read the Sermon on the Mount. After hearing uh, with what authority Jesus has just spoken, you know, everybody was amazed at the teaching of Jesus. You find that in chapter 7, verse 28 and 29. When Jesus had finished saying these things, the crowds were amazed at his teaching because he taught as one who had authority and not as their teachers of the law. Now the teacher of the law saw the way Jesus was teaching. Now any teacher would get attracted to another teacher who teaches better than them. I don't know if, you, if I stepped on your toe a little bit this morning. <laughs> Well, we, we appreciate every teacher in this place, in this church is the greatest teacher in the world. Um, but, you know, when you find somebody else in your profession who does better than you, who's really excelling in that, you naturally want to watch and see what makes them different. What makes them unique? What makes them great? What makes them powerful? What, makes, what draws the crowd to them? What attracts people to them? We want to think about it. We, we think about it. We, we, we want to notice that. And that's how this teacher of the law was watching how the crowds going behind Jesus and whatever they taught, the same Old Testament law he used. But the way he taught and the authority with which he spoke touched people's lives. They, they were drawn to Jesus. They were attracted to Jesus. And they followed Jesus. And so he said, I also want to become like a teacher like you. And he said, teacher, let me follow you. He was also a teacher of the law. And Jesus replied in verse 20, Foxes have holes, birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. What Jesus is saying here is, if you're willing to follow me, you've got to sacrifice. It's a life of sacrifice. It's not an easy life. It's not a fancy life. It's not about just getting out there and talking big stories and big things and drawing a lot of crowds and people being attracted and enjoying the popularity of the people. That's what even many people think ministry is like today. That they get excited looking at others. They see great men of God and they say, oh, let me also become like them. And so let me quit my job and do ministry. And then they discover it's not so easy. <laughs> popularity and name and fame don't come so easily. And that's not the goal of ministry. And this man had his... You know, his focus was for the wrong reason. His reason for why he wanted to follow Jesus was for the wrong reason. And that's why Jesus puts that first and he says, Foxes have holes and birds of the air, they have nests, they have a comfortable place. But, you know, serving me, following me is not going to be easy. You have to let go of everything that you need to let go. And in verse 21, another disciple said to him, Lord, first let me go and bury my father. Oh, then Jesus said, follow me and let the dead bury their own dead. And you find in another gospel of the, in the same uh, context where Jesus said, the one who has laid his hand on the plow and if he turns back, he's not fit for the kingdom of God. Once we made a choice to follow Jesus, 
we got to continue to follow Jesus. If we turn back and we give excuses and he say, and we say, you know, just for in this thing, I just have to compromise in this area. I just need to adjust. You know, it's a little bit of adjustment. You know, you need to understand. Sometimes people try to justify and give explanation and say, you know, we just need to understand in this modern world, you know, 21st century, you know, things are different. It was not like how it was in Jesus's day. Uh, you got to understand we are young people and we are, you know, in the modern lifestyle and this is a postmodern culture we are in. Um, you know, this is a different kind of, we are in a global village. We can, uh, many, many excuses can be given and we could just give a soft pat on our own backs and say, oh, it's all right. You know, you're not doing, it's not a sin. You know, it's just small mistakes. You know, we just replace words like sin with mistake and error, human error. It's natural for human beings to err, err, you know, how, how the devil deceives us, but it's the same stand that we have to take, you know, the word of God does not change, the, the standards of God's word don't change, it's the same yesterday, today and forever, Jesus doesn't change, his word doesn't change, hallelujah, so if anyone wants to follow Jesus, we got to know that it's a life of sacrifice, it's a life where we have to let go of what we need to let go. Where we, we, we may not be able to please people all the time. Well, people may want you to be at a birthday party on a Sunday evening and you choose to say, I go to church on a Sunday evening. And so you may end up, you know, uh, incurring the displeasure of uh, some people because you didn't go for their birthday party. But you chose to go to church and worship God. Amen. Hallelujah. So sometimes it, you may have, you may end up displeasing some people. You may uh, end up, you know, saying no to some people. We need to have the boldness to do that. Sometimes it's very difficult for some people to say a no. They would easily say no to Jesus. <laughs> but to tell a no to a friend who says, come, let's go out and eat. It's very difficult. To tell a no to somebody who says, uh, you know, just come, uh, you know, along with me. Let's just go here. Let's just go there. Come just help me out in this. Oh, it's good to help people. But we should, we should have the right balance. We can help people at other times. Uh, after we've finished our time with God and our, uh, you know, due responsibilities and, uh, you know, our ser in serving God and things like that. But it's important that we set our first priority to Jesus. Hallelujah. Our first love is for Jesus. Amen. You know, there he said, let me just go bury my father. Well, it looked almost, it looks like as if Jesus is very rude here. Oh, is it wrong for someone to go bury the father? Father? It sounds like as if it's very rude, but Jesus is making a point there. It, is, it doesn't mean that Jesus doesn't care about uh, what we need and our emotions. But what Jesus is driving at is that where the man said, I will follow you, Jesus is just trying to tell him, you think twice before you follow me. <laughs> you make a sure decision. You make a clear decision. You make a strong decision. You make an absolute decision. This is a decision where you cannot turn back, where there is no turning back. Hallelujah. 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 Someone uh, very recently in the last few years who was coming to know the Lord Jesus Christ very well. You know, that person came up to the point of baptism, was ready to be baptized, came from a non-Christian family and they, were, they accepted the Lord Jesus and they were growing in the faith and it was wonderful. They came up to the point of being baptized. But at that point, that person said, you know, there is one of my relatives for whom I need to do a, a ritual for them, uh, a non-Christian family. And she said, I need to do a ritual uh, in the marriage. And so I will finish that ritual in a few months time. The wedding will come. I will do the ritual and then I will come and be baptized. But unfortunately, her husband died suddenly between that time. Because she, did, she was not baptized, she, don't, she did not have the spiritual strength to continue in the faith. And unfortunately, sadly, she turned away from the Lord Jesus Christ. She turned away and went back from Jesus. She lost the salvation. 
but still she is there and we are still praying that God will bring her back to the faith. You know, sometimes when we are not strong, when we have not taken, you know, clear decisions and if we are like cat on the wall and something goes wrong in life, easily we can fall away from the faith. The devil will bring situations where we can fall from our faith. And that's where, you know, we read in the epistles, let a man who stands, let him not, you know, let him be careful, lest he fall. Let him not think he stands, lest he fall. So because we stand today, we, not, we should not be, you know, uh, proud that, oh, I'm standing. I, I can stand by myself. I can stand strong in following Jesus. But let, be careful lest we fall. And so God is cautioning us this morning. In, if you need to grow as a disciple in the Lord Jesus, we got to be consistent. We got to be constantly growing. A person who is not growing is backsliding. There's no middle ground. You're either, either moving forward or moving downward. You're moving upward or moving downward. You cannot stand and stagnate. There's no middle ground where we say, oh, I, I'm going to please a little bit of the people. You know the, you know, the Apostle Paul is talking about where there is no fellowship between light and darkness. How can light and darkness be in fellowship? Our fellowship is so important. Whom we fellowship with, whom we spend all our time with, whom we converse with all the time. That's so important. Because that determines where your heart is. That determines where your treasure is. You look at that scripture verse. Let me show it for you. In 2 Corinthians. In chapter number 6. 2 Corinthians chapter 6. Verse 14 onwards we read till the end of the chapter. Do not be yoked together with unbelievers. Do not be yoked together with unbelievers. For what do righteousness and wickedness have in common? Or what fellowship can light have with darkness? What harmony is there between Christ and Belial? What does a believer have in common with an unbeliever? What does a believer have in common with an unbeliever? We cannot go on saying, oh, they are very nice people. Yes, they are good people. We are not condemning anybody. But we cannot have fellowship with them. We cannot spend time with them. We cannot stay in their homes. We cannot go out with them. We cannot live with them. We cannot spend our life, share our lives, share our stories, share. You know, have you seen in, in many people, in many offices, they will come to the office and share their whole family story in the office. Everybody in the family, all the colleagues will know what is going on in the house. What the son is doing, what the daughter is doing, what the husband is doing, what the wife is doing. Everything is, the fellowship is in the office. And there they will give all negative comments. Oh, your son didn't go to the States. Oh, your daughter, she didn't go anywhere. Oh, my children are all in the States. Well, that makes you feel bad. Because you're sharing your stories with them. And they're asking, what mark did he get? Well, then you tell him, oh, my son, you know, he got 99.9%. Makes you still bad. Oh, you know what you can do? There's a new washing machine that's come. Get a loan. Even if you don't have money, don't worry. A new model of a fridge also has come. You know, the latest thing has come. You know, all, I'll help you for the finance. I'll help you for the loan. I know my, you know, Uncle's granddaughter is there. You can find a loan right away. Immediately, I'll arrange right now. One phone call. Oh, somebody dictates, somebody guides, somebody is leading you. Other people begin to lead. Non-Christians, people who do not believe on the Lord Jesus, people who cannot give you godly counsel, begin to lead. Who is leading you? Whose counsel are you hearing? Whose voice do you hear? Is it the voice of Jesus? Is it the will of God to do that? Are we being controlled, manipulated, influenced and led? Do we become like sheep taken to the slaughter in the hands of some non-Christian colleagues and friends? Sometimes some believers become like sheep who do not open their mouth who are taken to the slaughterhouse. They are led astray 
by some non christian friends unbelievers who who do not discern the will of god so where is our fellowship if we choose to follow jesus we cannot fellowship with unbelievers i'm not talking about friendship there's a difference between friendship and fellowship we need to be friendly with everybody we need and through worldly friends we need to win them for the lord jesus your intention for friendship should be to win them to jesus not to eat the laddu that comes after puja which they give to you if they give you the laddu you give them the bible amen do we have the boldness to do that do we have the courage to do that do you have the courage to tell them that jesus loves you you don't have to do these things you don't have to struggle in your life you don't have to suffer in your life jesus will deliver you tell them the word of god which standards the witness for the lord jesus christ and don't become helpless victims of somebody because oh what to do we have to eat lunch with them what to do we have to travel together you know with them what to do when i take a holiday they have to do my work don't get obligated we need favor with man but god will give favor you don't have to struggle to win a favor you don't have to please people you don't have to compromise to win a favor with people amen we if you enjoy favor with god you will enjoy favor with man hallelujah to enjoy favor with man what we need is favor with god if god is pleased with our ways if a man's ways are pleasing to the lord he will cause even his enemies to be friends with him to be at peace with him the bible says in proverbs hallelujah if you choose to follow jesus please the lord jesus christ in everything that is a mark of a disciple a disciple does what the master says that's what we're talking about the, a disciple does what the master expects a disciple does what the master expects even in his absence amen that is what is truly being a disciple true disciple will always choose to please his master hallelujah i don't know there might be many influences it might be unsaved christian relatives well some of you may have unsaved christian relatives they will say oh you don't know get this you know uh, bridegroom for your daughter they get this boy very rich family they'll give you a lot they're worth 8 crores and they'll give you 100 sovereigns of gold and 25 lakhs in cash and two houses and only son what more do you want your entire three generations down the line is taken care of with just the wealth of this one family all that you need to do is get your daughter married to them that's all what is the foundation of the marriage what is the foundation of the marriage now money property gold that becomes a foundation of the marriage they don't look at is this the will of god does god want them to do this you know where we lost the balance sometimes we get influenced like that we get excited we get attracted anything that attracts us distracts us anything that attracts distracts let jesus be right in front of us ask him is this your will lord a disciple will ask the master before he does anything a disciple will ask the master master's will is this what the master wants me to do do we love jesus 100% i want to show you another scripture verse from matthew's gospel chapter 22 we need to grow in being a disciple of the lord jesus christ grow in being a disciple i want to be more like jesus a disciple wants to be like his master hallelujah like the master in matthew chapter 22 verse 34 to 40 
34 to 40. You see what Jesus, hearing that Jesus had silenced the Sadducees, the Pharisees got together. One of them, an expert in the law, tested him with this question. Teacher, which is the greatest commandment of the law? Jesus replied, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the first and the greatest commandment. And the second is like it, love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. Very, very familiar scripture verse. We all know it by heart. But to love Jesus means to please Jesus. To love Jesus means to obey Jesus. If you love me, you will obey my commandments, Jesus said. If you love me, you will obey. By obedience to his commands, we show that we love him. By doing what pleases him, we show that we love him. It's not by saying in word of mouth, oh, I love you, Lord. It's not by singing a song that says, I love you, Jesus. It's easy. Anybody will do that. But in how we show our love, how we do things, how we obey his word, how we live according to his word, that's how we show our love to Jesus. Hallelujah. Do we truly love Jesus? Three times Jesus asked Peter, do you love me? Do you truly love me? Why? Because just before that, he had turned away and gone back to his fishing profession. And when he went away, all the other disciples also followed him after Jesus rose from the dead. He went back. And that's why Jesus stops and asks Peter, do you really love me, Peter? Because he turned back. God does not want anyone, any of us to turn back, turn away in any area of your life. Follow him. Hallelujah. Fellowship with him. Not with the people of the world, not with the unbelievers, not with the ungodly. Not with those people who are not the right people. Fellowship with God and fellowship with God's people. Hallelujah. Amen. That's how we grow as a disciple of the Lord Jesus. Secondly, firstly we saw that we have to follow him. Follow him. Let go of everything that needs to be, that we need to let go of in growing as a disciple. Secondly, to grow as a disciple, we need to be faithful to Jesus till the very end. He who endures till the end will be saved. He who endures till the end. We need to endure in this life. Endure in this walk. Endure following Jesus till the very end. Disturbances will come. Deceptions will come. Temptations will come. Problems will come. Crisis may come. Challenges will come. But whatever may come, we should consistently follow Jesus. We should take a firm decision that whatever may come may, my way, I will continue to follow Jesus. That is faithfulness. Turn with me to Luke's Gospel chapter 14. Luke chapter 14. We read verses 25 to 34. 25 to 34. It's important that we are faithful. Count the cost. The large crowds were traveling with Jesus and turning to them, he said, If anyone comes to me and does not hate his father and mother, his bro wife and children, his brothers and sisters, yet even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. And anyone does not carry his cross and follow me, cannot be my disciple. Now, you need to understand that this is uh, in the present continuous tense. You read there in Luke 14, 27, Anyone who does not carry his cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. This is not carrying the cross one time. This is not just making a decision one time. But this is carrying the cross daily and following Jesus, being his disciple. Now the cross that each of us may have to carry would be different. Each one may have to carry a different cross. The price that you have to pay, the cross talks about the price that Jesus paid. The cross that you may have to carry, the price you have to pay would be different. For each one it is different. The temptations are different. The challenges are different. The problems that you face and the decisions that you have to make in following Jesus, in being a disciple is different. So when you have to make a decision, it's your choice. It's not somebody else's choice. Each one of us have to carry our own cross and follow Jesus. You cannot, you know, somebody else cannot carry your cross. It's your cross, your decisions, the choices that you have to make. When I was a student, I remember I always, you know, uh, hung out with friends uh, who, are, who are not, 
in the, in the Lord. They were, they were Christians, but they were, they were not believers. All, most of them were smokers. Most of them would drink. And all of them would take off from college, one college, go, to, go for movies. Um, and this was happening all the time. And they would always call me. But after some time, they knew that I wouldn't turn up for such kind of things. They would meet up in some friend's house and they would uh, have a booze party there. And some of their moms would serve booze for them as well. And so, you know, that was the kind of culture, that was the kind of circle of friends I had. But yet, not once have I had a sip of drink with them. Not once have I tasted cigarettes. I was growing up 17, 18, 19, 20. That's a time when you can easily get influence. Right? When we, you know, on the way to college, right when you get on to the, you know, station, train station, right there on the platform, they start off smoking. And MCC was a good college, but they had full freedom to smoke anywhere on the campus. Unfortunately, called as a Christian college. It is the only institution where students can smoke on the campus in the cafeteria and was sold there. So, it was, it was style and it was, um, and you know, the, while they were ragging me, the, f the question they would always ask, all the seniors would ask us, you know, uh, they would first question, where are you from? Say, I live in Ananagar. Oh, Ananagar. You know, Ananagar always, eyebrows raise up a little bit. Uh, they think you're very rich and things like that. And the second thing, the question is, so do you drink? Uh, no. Smoke? No. Huh? You live in Ananagar? You don't do all these things. They would be surprised and they would compel, they would keep saying, come on man, it's okay, no harm, uh, nobody's watching you, you don't become a drunkard just because you taste a little bit, good excuses, we can be easily faithful in the church <laughs> on a Sunday and be holy and be prayerful and be worshipping and be singing, and but when you go out on a Monday to Friday, that's where the challenge is. That's where the challenge is. Everybody is doing it. All of them are Christians. They all do go to church. And they all, many of them do sing in choirs. They play music. Oh, they, they are all involved in ministry as well. But because everybody is doing it, it's not possible for us to do it. You know, pressure, temptations, for each one it will be different. For each person it's different. But you know what? God wants an undivided attention all the time. You got to carry your cross daily. Carry your cross daily. Even professors will, con you know, compel. You go out on a trip, outstation trips, vacation trips, and, and from college, they will compel. Hey, come on, drink, man. Everybody is drinking. Drink. They will compel. There was one Christian professor sitting next to me in a van while we were traveling on a trip at Goa. He said, uh, you know, buy me booze tonight. I, I said, your body is the temple of the living God. If anybody, you know, destroys the body, God will destroy him. It's there in scripture verse I quoted. He was my professor sitting next to me. I didn't look at him, but I looked straight and I just quoted the verse. <laughs> and he almost failed me the next semester. <laughs> That's okay, even if he failed me. Hallelujah. Sometimes you've got to be bold. That word of God will convict him. He's a Christian. He knows the word of God. He goes to church. But sometimes we have to be bold. They are Christians. You know, sometimes Christians do these kind of funny things. Wherever we are, whatever kind of setting you may be in, where it might be a private place. It might be a secret place. It might be where no... Nobody is there, none of your relatives, none of your friends, none of the church folk are there. The pastor is not there. But God is there. Amen. If you go up on a high on a mountain, God is there. If you go down to the depths of the sea, God is there. Spirit of God is there. He's watching over us. He knows us. I'm not trying to condemn us. I'm not trying to, you know, bring some kind of guilt on us. But what the word of God says is that we need to be ready to carry the cross. And follow Jesus. We need to be ready to pay the price. Incur the displeasure of people. Lose certain things. Lose certain favors. Lose certain benefits from people. But do the right thing. Hallelujah. 
be faithful all the time. Verse 28 onwards we read Luke 14. Suppose one of you wants to build a tower. Will he not first sit down and estimate the cost to see if he has enough money to complete it? If he says, if he lays the foundation and is not able to finish it, everyone who sees it will ridicule him. Saying this fellow began to build and was not able to finish. It's not about how we begin. It's about how we finish. People start well in their spiritual life and somewhere along the way fall away from the faith. Fall away from the, you know, the love that they had for God. The first love that they once had. It's important we finish well in our faith. Apostle Paul at the end of his life says, I've run the race, I've finished well. Hallelujah. Now there is in store for me a crown of righteousness whom the Lord will give. Hallelujah. He, he, he was able to turn back and say, I ran the race well. I fought a good fight. I finished the race. I have done whatever God wanted me to do in my life. You should rejoice at the end of the road. Rejoice and finish your life with joy. Hallelujah. It's not how great you start, it's how great you finish. People start well. Many start well. Everybody starts well. But very few finish well. It is said even in Bible colleges, this is the stats about Bible colleges, that about only 60 to 70 percent of the graduates that graduate from a Bible college who enter into ministry finish well. Only 60 to 70 percent of those who graduate actually end up doing a good ministry and finishing well. If it can be so for those who are trained for ministry or called for ministry, how much more for every one of us? How much more we should be careful that I want to be faithful in everyday life. Everything that I do. Hallelujah. Never to displease the Lord Jesus. Never to turn away from Him. Never to compromise. Hallelujah. Wherever you may go on the face of this earth, follow Jesus. Be faithful to Jesus. Hallelujah. Whatever circumstances, whatever kind of pressure, Whatever kind of opposition you may face also. Sometimes it's both pressure and opposition. People may oppose you following Jesus. Would you stand firm? Maybe some of you who come from a non-Christian family background. When it comes to your wedding, there may be pressure where people will say, you, you know, parents will say, relatives will say, oh, what about our family tradition? What about, you know, who will come if you marry a Christian? It's okay if nobody doesn't come. All that we need is Jesus. I thought we'll be more excited to say an amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Even if nobody comes, if Jesus comes with you, that's enough, brother, sister. Hallelujah. Don't give in to pressure to marry someone who does not share your faith for the sake of compromising and pleasing somebody else. Be faithful in following Jesus. Be faithful to finish well. Our goal is to finish well. Verse 31. Or suppose a king is about to go on to war against another king. Will he not first sit down and consider whether he is able with 10,000 men to oppose the one coming against him with 20,000? If he is not able, he will send a delegation while the other is still long way off and will ask for terms of peace. In the same way, any of you who go, does not give up everything he has cannot be my disciple salt is good but if it loses its saltiness how can it be made salty again salt is good but if it loses its saltiness it cannot be made salty again sometimes when people fall they fall so badly that sometimes they never get revived and so it's important that we are careful to retain the saltiness the essence of Christian life the essence of what it is to be a believer, what it takes to be a Christian should be preserved. If we lose the saltiness, if we lose this essence, it's impossible to get it back again. Some people get deceived and they go on in their deception and it's sometimes impossible to get them out of their deception. Even the elect are deceived, the Bible says. The elect are deceived. He who has a ear, let him hear. You see, 
Jesus said, follow me. And he says, follow my example. Turn to John 13. How we should be faithful to follow Jesus. It's not about how we begin to follow Jesus. It's about being faithful in following Jesus. John 13. Read there from verse 13 onwards. You call me teacher and Lord and rightly so. And for that is what I am. Now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also should wash one another's feet. I have set you an example that you should do as I have done for you. I tell you the truth, no servant is greater than his master, nor his messenger greater than the one who sent him. Now that you know these things, you will be blessed if you do them. Oh, washing the feet of the disciples. How will a master wash the feet of a disciple? A disciple needs to wash the feet of a master. And that too, he washes the feet of the one who is going to betray him. He knows the one who is going to betray him. He still goes on to wash his feet. He modeled it for us, the act of humility and love. And verse 1 says, Jesus knew the time had come for him to leave this world and go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he now showed them the full extent of his love. To be following Jesus means to be faithful in doing what he has done to model his life faithful to finish well faithful to model his life his way of life how did jesus live how did jesus do things he loved the one who's going to betray him he loved the one who's going to deny him he washed their feet model the life of jesus look at the word of god and see how jesus lived Read the word of God and see how Jesus spoke. Jesus, how he dealt with people. How he responded. That's how we also need to become more like Jesus. That's being faithful in growing as a disciple. And he says in, in the same chapter, verse number 34 and 35. A new command I give you, love one another. As I have loved you, so you must also love one another. And by this, all men will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. By this, how will people know we are his disciples? How will people see Jesus in us? How? When we live like Jesus. When we live like Jesus. To be faithful to live like Jesus. To be faithful to Jesus does not mean to just sing about how we are faithful. It's not just to say by word of mouth, Lord, I'm faithful to you. But it is to live like Jesus. How did Jesus live? How he loved one another. How he loved his disciples. How he loved the one who was going to betray him. By this, they will know, the world will know that you are my disciples. Hallelujah. If we need to make a difference in this world, that we are children of God, that if we need to show Jesus to the world, it is through our act of love. It is through a lifestyle of love. It is through unconditional love. It is by having a heart of forgiveness and love. That is what will make the difference in this world. Everybody hates. Everybody is selfish. The world is a selfish world. The world is a hateful world, an angry world, a bitter world. To give another inch on the road in the middle of a traffic for someone else's vehicle is a very difficult thing for drivers in Chennai. That's the kind of world. I don't care about how you live. I don't care about your convenience. I don't care whether it feels good for you or not. I want to have my way. It's, I'm important. I need to be taken care of. My convenience is important. My life is more important. I don't care about you. That's what the world says. It's, have you heard of this old English a proverbial statement, the survival of the fittest? That's a very selfish statement. That's not biblical. <laughs> survival of the fittest. I want to be fit. I want to survive. Whether it's getting into a crowded bus I don't care about you. I'll push everybody and I'll jump in. They don't care. That's the kind of world we live in. If they have to step on our head and climb up the ladder, in the corporate world, they will still do that. If they can 
backbite and they can put false accusations they can take all the credit for all the work you have done they will do that and they will get their promotion they want to be up on the top they don't care how it feels for you how it hurts for you that's the kind of world we live in that's where we are going to make the difference that's where we are going to be faithful to jesus to say i'm going to love jesus i'm going to love the people because i follow jesus i am a disciple of jesus hallelujah it's hard it's not easy it will not happen overnight you will not succeed in every attempt but you keep attempting keep talking to yourself let the word of god keep speaking to your heart and say i'm going to be a disciple of jesus i'm going to make a difference in this world i'm going to live differently hallelujah and you see how people are going to follow jesus through you the world will know that we are his disciples when we love like jesus when we model a lifestyle like jesus hallelujah it's easy to be selfish it's easy it makes it convenient to be selfish but it takes a selfless heart a heart like jesus to be a disciple of jesus meditate on the word of god i'm going to close with this scripture verse we can go on much more talking about how we can grow in being a disciple of the lord jesus christ but i've just touched on only two points this morning numbers chapter 14 i'm just going to leave us with this scripture verse in verse 24 numbers 14 24 but because my servant caleb has a different spirit and follows me wholeheartedly i will bring him into the land he went to and his descendants descendants will inherit it because my servant caleb has a different spirit hallelujah we the children of god we god's people have a different spirit what is the different spirit the different spirit that follows god wholeheartedly wholeheartedly wholehearted devotion to the lord follow jesus be faithful to jesus whatever you need to let go let go of it follow jesus be faithful to him have an undivided attention to him carry your cross go through the hard pain and the suffering that you may have to go through obey him love him share his love be faithful to finish well let your eyes be on finishing well have a whole hearted devotion like caleb have a different spirit what was the blessing that caleb received he entered the promised land hallelujah he and his descendants there were the 12 tribes the heads of the tribes of israel who went all of them brought a different report except for joshua and caleb and none of them who brought a different report entered the promised land only caleb and joshua entered the promised land hallelujah shall we pray and commit ourselves to the lord there is always a reward for those who follow jesus wholeheartedly who are faithful till the very end there is always a reward you will never go without a reward it is easy to preach only on the blessing and the reward i can still do that but if we do not understand what it takes to receive the blessing we will not really have the blessing it might feel good to listen to a message that talks about the blessing and the reward but what we need to hear what we need to practice is what we need to hear if we will put it to practice not just to be hearers of the word but to be doers of the word if we will put it into practice we will be like a man who built the house on the rock hallelujah when the storms may come the winds may blow we will not fall hallelujah you will stand strong you will have your due reward for all the sufferings that you go through for all the price that you pay the disciples came to jesus and asked him lord we have left family we have left father mother brother sister wealth everything we have left everything and we followed you what will we receive lord jesus said you will have a hundred times in reward for all that you have sacrificed you will have a hundred time blessing a hundred fold blessing a hundred times more in return for all the pain the suffering 
the displeasure that you incur from people, the hardships that you go through, the delays, the denials that you receive from people, the displeasure that you incur from them, the dishonor that you incur, the reproach that you incur, all that you go through, all the suffering, all the shame that you go through, you will receive a hundredfold reward for that. Caleb had a wholehearted devotion and he entered the promised land. Ultimately, brother, sister, we want to make sure that we want to enter the promised land. Hallelujah. Even if we gain the whole world, what profits a man if he gains the whole world, yet if he loses his own soul? What profits a man? Lord, I want to sacrifice this world. I want to sacrifice the sin of this world, the pleasures of the sin. And I want to sacrifice pleasing people and gain eternal life. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.